Hallo und herzlich willkommen zum Kurs. Ich heiße Dr. Richard Grass und ich werde Ihr Lehrer sein. In diesem Kurs werden wir die Methoden zur Verarbeitung von Textdaten lernen. Hier sind zwei Tatsachen, die allgemein angenommen werden. 90% der nützlichen Daten liegen im Textformat vor. Arbeitnehmer verbringen durchschnittlich 30% ihrer Zeit mit der Suche nach Informationen. Also das ist wichtig. Das ist ein interessantes Thema, kann aber auch kompliziert werden. Die Verwendung von Textdaten erfordert eine Vielzahl von Fähigkeiten. Diese Technik, diese Techniken stammen aus der Informatik, Computerlinguistik, Statistik, Bibliothekwissenschaft und Psychologie. Ich hoffe, dass Sie viel lernen und sich amüsieren werden. Uh, es tut mir leid, aber mein Deutsch ist schlecht, uh, so the course will be taught in English, and I hope that's okay. So, um, text analytics is a growing field. Uh, it's changing quite a bit, and it's a very exciting time to be doing this. Um, it, it stems from this basic insight that um, there's a lot of data, a lot of strategically useful data that is currently locked up in text format. So, um, you know, here are some examples of tech, you know, internal and external documents that could have some, you know, very important and useful insights. But the problem is that um, because it is unstructured, that is, you know, it doesn't doesn't really have any kind of obvious numerical representation. Um, it's difficult to figure out exactly how we go about, you know, running statistical analyses or building visualizations. So, so the basic challenge of text analytics is starting from um, documents, you know, whether these come from social media or from, you know, repair logs or from speeches or call logs or, or health records. Um, we're trying to get it into some kind of useful form. Okay. Um, so the, the, Content of this course is going to come from three books that I use in um, the 15 week long course that I teach here at Radford University. Um, Deep Text by Tom Remy, uh, Practical Text Analysis by Steven Stuhl, and um, Text Analytics with Python. We're not going to be doing any Python programming in this course. Um, so we're really just going to be, you know, using existing software to kind of run some, um, you know, run, look at the basic techniques rather than doing any kind of programming here. So um, text analytics has a, a wide variety of definitions, and I've tried to put together what I think is a um, kind of a diagram that explains all the different pieces. Um, so text analytics really consists of, of three kind of large sub areas, um, natural language processing, information retrieval, and text mining. So um, th this idea is that we, we start off with our collection of documents. And what we want to do is get some kind of numerical data from those documents that we can have some sort of uh, intermediate representation for. And then we have, you know, a couple of different ways that we could go about using that. So when we, when we start with the raw text data and then extract information from it, um, this is really the realm of something called natural language processing. And this is typically, um, you know, this typically is the domain of computer science and information theory. Um, you know, Dealing from like simple to complex here, um, you know, the, the obvious low hanging fruit for turning text into numbers is looking at term frequencies. Um, then, you know, we, we can look at part of speech tagging, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, sentiment analysis. This is um, trying to understand the mood or the tone of a certain piece of text. Um, semantic analysis, where we try to understand the meaning in terms of a like a taxonomy of knowledge. Um, breaking down text into a small number of topics and then looking at the distribution of those topics, um, identifying people, places, um, you know, named entities, so-called. And then, and then from there, um, we can go from entities into relationships between entities and, um, you know, more specifically kind of getting exact information, you know, being able to answer questions, 
um, and then finally classification of documents. So this is just one one kind of area of concern involved in this whole process of text analytics. So if we if we you know use these methods to extract data and um, you know, call it the feature matrix. So now we have data. Um, if what we're trying to do is come up with some kind of automated processing that will reveal insights, then this is typically called text mining. And so this is where you really start to get into the kind of spooky mathematical things. Um, we are in this course going to be doing some logistic regressions, but um, also this is where you typically see neural networks and hidden Markov models and conditional random fields. The basic idea is that they're just looking for patterns. Um, but this is just, you know, one particular area that emphasizes the automated, um, the automated discovery of knowledge. Um, if, on the other hand, we're going to, you know, go from this natural language and then store the information that we extract from it as metadata, then we are kind of going in this direction of traditional information retrieval, where we are, our main emphasis is to, you know, the information is here, and we really are just trying to make it in a way that is um, available and aggregated in a way that a human analyst can get something out of it. And so in here, we see issues of taxonomies and, and indexing and query processing, relevance judgments, um, you know, human computer interaction and fasted navigation. Okay. So these are like the three primary areas that fall under the general heading of text analytics. So again, this is all about just trying to turn, you, you know, uh, text data into some kind of something that's going to be useful for the enterprise. So um, as you can see, this is quite a diversity of emphases. And, um, you know, if you look at the research in text analytics, um, I, I personally am never sure whether I'm going to be, you know, deep in the bowels of a neural network, or if I'm going to be looking at something having to do with the psychology of language or, you know, just something involving, you know, building a useful index or a visualization. So there's, there's quite a lot going on here. So, so this course, which is a curated, um, smaller version of the 15-week course that I teach, is going to just hit a few of these areas. It will seem like we're bouncing all over the place, but like I said, there's a diversity of different things that go on in here. Um, we're going to look at, you know, what's, what's called n-gram analysis on the first day. Uh, there's a um, there's a, a lot of mathematical ways of 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 quantifying the relevance of a of a words to a certain um, information need. Um, we will be uh, we'll be we'll be doing sentiment analysis on day three, semantic analysis also. Um, we're we're also going to be doing a little bit with taxonomies around Thursday, um, some relevance judgments, and um, we'll we'll be doing a little bit down here with the logistic regressions. Uh, we might do a little more there depending on what what the interest is like. Um, so so this is kind of the the broad overview of of, of what we're going to be doing. Um, let me just go over really quickly what the what the course schedule looks like. So I framed. All of the content as as having um, a, a business application and a, a technical topic, a specific technical competency, and these readings over here um, kind of demonstrate both the technical side and they are uh, they demonstrate how these technical methods are contributing to some some kind of business emphasis. Um, so we're going to be looking at strategy the first day, and we'll be taking a look at some prevalence metrics, particularly coming from this uh, fan article. Um, on the second day, we're going to be looking at entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so we're, the you know, are there certain words and phrases that tend to lead to better success in gaining um, investment than others? And we'll be looking at that. So here are the technical topics that'll come into play there. Um, Finally, we're going to take a look at quality control. I've published a couple of articles in this area myself. Um, you know, doing doing these these kinds of analyses to try to try to gauge the the quality of a product. Um, and um, finally, uh, well, not finally. On Thursday, we'll take a look at some human resources. Um, so these these articles here. Um, 
analyze the way certain human resource issues are discussed uh, um, in the hopes of leading to insights about how people justify certain things, certain practices. Um, and then finally, we'll conclude on Friday with a look at international management. Uh, there's a, a really interesting paper looking at how Twitter encodes national character. Um, and we'll be doing a, a little bit of, of competitive classification. I'm going to give you an exercise and we'll do a little bit of machine learning. And um, we'll be looking at uh, these as, as measures of success in that task. Okay. So um, the, the software uh, that I typically use for this course, uh, we do a lot with these first two, Excel and uh, SAS Jump. Um, I... Um, I'm, I've been kind of assuming that you'll have access to Excel and Jump. You may have access to that as a student. Um, if not, uh, there's a there's a free 30-day download that you can use. We only need it for, for five days. Um, this is free and it's a Java application. I'll show you how to install that and we'll work with that. And um, I don't know if we'll have time for this Rapid Miner. Uh, it's, it's kind of a neat tool that, that brings a bunch of these things together. And it, it's kind of an example about how all of these techniques kind of add up into one big software package. But I don't know if we're going to have time for that. Um, okay, so, uh, so as I said, the course will be in English. And um, the text analytics research that I've seen is typically done in English. But... Um, I spent the last couple of days just uh, out of curiosity going and seeing uh, what are the, you know, are there real big differences between what we do when we're processing English text versus um, German text? And uh, we'll take a look at those. Okay, so I'm going to drill down just a little bit in this area, the natural language processing area, and just uh, show you some of the some of the topics that that fall under that heading. Um, so over the past several years, I've been kind of collecting what people are doing within natural language processing, and I've been sorting them in order of complexity. So as we move down here, we are addressing tasks that are more and more difficult um, so you can see down here at the bottom, uh, discourse analysis, which is kind of a communication theory thing, um, trying to do automated things with understanding context and intentionality is, is, is a lot more difficult, a lot more subtle of a task than these ones up here at the top. So this, again, is just a subset of ones that I've collected. And um, the these two here are you know considered to be pretty much solved. Uh, that, that we can do this automated processing of these tasks fairly well. Um, and uh, But even then, we're still dealing with some, some challenges. So uh, this first thing here, morphological segmentation. Okay, this is, this is just a fancy way of saying breaking up a word into its pieces. Okay, so here's, here's an example of a word in English. We've got its prepaying where we have a, you know, we've got a suffix here. This is, we got a fairly, you know, small and standard set of suffixes. And we've got um, a prefix here. Um, so we've got a prefix and a suffix. And then we've got our root right here. And obviously the root is the interesting piece here. So this process of just taking, you know, you know, we'll say, okay, we'll tell the computer that our we're dealing with a language that is um, white space delimited, uh, such as such as um, in most Western languages. Um, and but within here we are going to have to break this down into pieces, such that a root is going to be the interesting one. And I'll show you why this this comes up. Um, here's, here's, um, I've got a set of movie reviews here. There's, um, let's see. Um, I think I've got a thousand of them. Uh, okay. So there's, there's a thousand, uh, negative movie reviews here, and I might be interested in the ones that involve, uh, uh, sw some kind of swimming. So I could do you know, something like, um, I'll look through here. We can call this a database. It's a file system, but it's still a database. Um, so, uh, okay, so it looks like we've got, um, you know, 
we've got a few texts here that contain the word swim. Uh, so let's see how many exactly. Um, okay, so 18 contain the word swim. But this is not going to, we're going to miss a lot here unless we take into consideration that we also have the past tense of swam. Okay, so there's five that have swam in it. Um, we've got um, the past participle form is swum. Okay, um, and then of course there are you know the the gerund format swimming. So it turns out that swimming is in there ten times. Um, so we've got a lot of different uh, forms of the word that we have to take into consideration. So we might just say, well, we'll make our, our searches uh, more comprehensive by searching for everything. Or we can pre-process the, the, the text documents. You know, let's say we could do like a, you know, a said where we do a, a global replace where we just say, okay, anytime you see, you know, swim or, or swam or swum or swimming that you, you know, you do a global replace and we just stick with the the, with the root form of that word, okay, so the, the, infin the infinitive form, okay? So this process is actually, you know, where, where you just um, convert a word into its, um, you know, into its basic root form is just called stemming. And stemming is where we, you know, there are a lot of different forms of stemming, and there's the porter stemmer and the snowball stemmer, but it basically comes down to just, you know, identifying this part of the word and then putting a little dash there to say, okay, anything, anything that has this in it plus anything. So it turns out that in German, you get a lot more mileage out of this than in English. So we don't have a whole lot of um, inflectional forms. Um, we, we have a very simple conjugation of our verbs and we don't change our adjectives at all. So uh, stemming, it turns out, uh, gives you a lot more, um, a, a lot more uh, accuracy in German. You get a lot more mileage by stemming. So all of these are different forms of, of, of this basic um, form right here. Okay. So um, it turns out, you know, there, so there's a major difference here. Um, another difference that uh, was interesting, I just came across this in a paper, is in um, part of speech tagging. So part of speech tagging is just um, you know going through going through text and assigning a part of speech. Now this is considered to be fairly straightforward. It's not it's not all that complicated, and and the current automated ways of assigning parts of speech are quite accurate. Um, so why would this be important? Well, you know, let's say we've got um, you know we're we're uh, let's say we make dies, okay, uh, and and of course die could be die as in sterben, and it could be die as in um, I think it's uh, I'm sorry if I'm misspelling this I think it's uh, something like der Virtue or something like that. Okay, so you know so it's 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 this thing that you that you roll um, when you're gambling. Okay, so we've got we've got the same We've got the same word, and we're really interested in this version of it. And so we would get quite far if we are just able to say, okay, well, find me all the occurrences of die where it is referring to a noun, okay? And this is a verb, okay? So we've just narrowed down the, the possible matches quite a bit. So there's a real, uh, real important application of doing this part of speech tagging. So in English, we just go in order with the dog ate the cat. And so they can say, okay, well, this is a, this, a, this is determiner. Uh, this means a noun. This is a past tense verb and another determiner that is an article, a definite article here and here. And we've got um, another, another noun. Okay. So in this case, it's, it's functioning as a, as an object. Okay. So, um, the the way that this is usually done is um, is using what are called language models, and language models are are really just probability distributions over words. So, for example, let's say I've got um, this is just one sentence in my corpus. So, corpus is our our term for our set of documents. So, we've got this and 
when we build a language model, what we're doing is assigning probabilities to certain things, so to certain words or certain sequences of words. So for example, I would just say the probability of, and I'll just convert it to lowercase, the probability of there being a word I. Okay, and I might just say, okay, well, based on relative frequency, um, it's, you know, the probability of something being an I is like this. Now, then we can go on and say, okay, well, what's the probability that the word have appears given that the previous word was an I? Okay, so basically the probability of the phrase I have, probability of seeing a have after seeing an I. Okay, so this might be, you know, it, it, would, it would be smaller than the one above, of course. Okay, and let's see. So now we can do um, had. So the probability of seeing had, given that we've seen I and have. Okay, and so, you know, again, we're, you know, we're dealing with a whole language here. So, so we basically build a giant probability table. If, you know, you've probably seen the autocorrect, uh, what, what your phone has been doing is building up a whole uh, corpus for you, and it knows the probabilities that you're going to say certain words after you say other ones. So it builds a language model within it. Now, it turns out that in English, um, how far back do we have to go? So obviously, we don't want to have to have every single possible word sequence. This, this would just be too big. Um, obviously too big to fit in the memory of a phone. So um, how many do we have to go back? Well, it turns out that in English, three is plenty. And so this so-called trigram language model, trigram language model. And you get a lot of accuracy. Uh, so, um, well, we can also use language models in a more general way for part of speech tagging. So, for example, if we just take this, we know, okay, well, that I, that is a personal pronoun. So, uh, you know, instead of dealing with individual words, if we want to be able to, you know, accurately identify parts of speech in here, we can say the probability of a personal pronoun, okay? And then likewise, okay, so this is a, um, you know, this is a verb. So, um, and it's a present tense verb, so it would just be the probability of a verb given that you just had a personal pronoun. And then if we do the, the uh, so this is a, this is an infinitive verb, right? Oh, well, no, a past participle verb. So we'll say, um, and I think this is like this, I'm not sure. So past participle verb given that we've just seen a personal pronoun and a verb, okay? So you can build these probabilities having to do with um, just parts of speech. So you can identify the, the characteristics of the language, just, uh, you know, the, the typical order that you have for the, you know, for, work, for parts of speech. So um, it turns out that in German, this, um, it doesn't work quite so easily. And it's because of um, looking back to, um, so German is a little bit more relaxed with word order than English. So um, we have these, um, these terms here, der and den. Um, uh, let's see, and there's, there's another one, and there's another one. Well, so it turns out that um, we, this, these, these can be, as obviously you know better than I, these can be definite determiners, relative pronouns, or demonstrative pronouns. And our way of knowing, if we just go in order, there's no way that anything before could give you any information about that. Okay? And um, in this case, this case also, uh, we, don't, we can't really identify which of those it is or you know, which part of speech this one is, unless we are looking at the context afterwards. So it might be, you know, some, some uh, experimenters have said, well, let's try doing part of speech tagging in German in reverse. You know, let's start at the back and go forward instead of going forward back. Um, it turned out not to yield any greater accuracy. It, it turns out that recent work has determined that um, in German, you get 
the most accuracy and part of speech tagging if you do one before and one after. Okay, interesting, interesting difference between the two. You don't in English you don't ever have to look after to get a good part of speech tagging using a language model. Um, the other thing that differs uh, is that there's something that has to be done in German that we don't ever do in English, and it has to do with decomposition. Um, so, uh, you know, in German we have, uh, turns out there's a lot more longer words in, in German than in French or English. The, the number of very lengthy words is a lot higher in German than it is in English. So you get words like this, Überlebensperspektiven and um, uh, Medikamenten spenden Sammlung. Okay, so these, you know, these compound words that are, that are constructed with, you know, smaller words put together. Um, so, you know, that, that's fine, but what, what, what do you do about this if you are going to build a language model how do you, do you go ahead and assign probabilities to the larger of the words? And um, the problem is that, well, if you do, you're going to have an awfully large language model because the, the word Stadt, the um, compound starting with Stadt, there's, there's already over 4,000 of those. So it's probably not a great idea to make an entry for every single word, but, you know, so what do you do? Well, okay, do you go ahead and decompound? That is, do you try to find the shortest? So in that case, you just have your, your computer algorithm go letter by letter until it gets to something that it identifies and says, okay, we'll, we'll chop that off there. Then we go to another, um, you know, so do we take the shortest possible or do we start with the whole thing and then chop off words and, and then take the longest possible? So um, this is still an area of research. Uh, this paper just published last year on the decomposition problem. Uh, very interesting to me because this is something that we don't ever have to do in English. We just, uh, it, we tend not to combine words in this way. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I would like to, request that you complete an assignment um, for the first day of class. So we're going to be meeting on Monday, April 8th, and I'm asking you to write a short 150 to 200 word introduction about yourself to me. And I don't know if you all know each other, um, um, but uh, uh, this would be a chance for me to get to know you. And if you don't already know them, your classmates. Um, so just share whatever you think is important. And, um, you know, nothing too private because we're going to be doing some analysis of this. So this will be, uh, there will be a dual objective here. I, it's a chance for me to get to know you, but then it's also going to be the first piece of text that we're going to be analyzing. So um, please bring a printed copy to class on the first day. So either you can write it out, you know, longhand on paper, or if you have access to a printer, just type it up and print it out. Okay. All right, and um, so my email address you already have, and um, please let me know if you have any questions or concerns before the start of class. I'm happy to answer any any questions that you have over email, okay? Um, so uh, I, I look forward to meeting you all, and I will see you in about a week.